Aloha and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii for uh, this show. The show is the state of the state of Hawaii, and I'm your host, Stephanie Paul Dalton. Uh, as you know, this show is about newsworthy topics and rising issues of affecting our state. And today's focus is on uh, faith-based faith communities' experiences under COVID. With contagion threatening from everywhere as it has in Hawaii um, over our year of um, this or more, um, um, how, how is it that churches and pastors and parishioners meet their, their congregation's spiritual needs um, and uh, at the same time pursue and ensure that their outreach to the numerous vulnerable and needy subgroups they tr traditionally serve, how do they manage all of this? I feel that the word has, I haven't been as, a, as uh, exposed to media and, and uh, topics that just now and then on this topic. And um, I'm, I realized that and thought that maybe the viewers too would like to know more, have an expert come and, and give us a real close up look at it. And today we have such an expert, deeply experienced uh, to share the experience of a church community uh, working um, through the pandemic crisis. And uh, he is Father David Gerlach. He's rector at uh, St. Elizabeth's Episcopal Church in Palama. So welcome Father David. Good afternoon. Nice to see you, Stephanie. So good to have you here and that you can take the time. And um, I um, I think that um, it may even be a sacrifice on your part. I'm sorry, but I really think it's a, an important issue to raise awareness about. I uh, I just uh, would like to start with uh, what, where you're comfortable to start, but it's a question about how our faith-based communities under the stress and demand of um, contagion and, and certainly limited budgets in um, how are you keeping faith alive while maintaining the food security, the hygiene, the cleanliness programs, the other regular services uh, that uh, the state's neediest people and subgroups really depend on. So maybe you could describe to us a little bit about what that challenge is. Well, St. Elizabeth's is uh, a church that's been in Palama for 120 plus years. Um, we've been very involved in the local community in terms of trying to meet the needs of basically a, an immigrant community and a generally economically poor community. Um, and of course, we have members who are from many generations who have moved out to the suburbs and, and are doing you know, fine uh, financially. So two things really, to meet the needs of our elders who are maybe retired, don't live in the community and so forth. Once COVID hit, we really were having to rely on telephone calls and letters. Uh, we began issuing our monthly newsletter every week, uh, which we continue to do to keep people informed of what's going on and just to try to stay in touch. Um, and that part's been very hard. you know. I've written hundreds and hundreds of letters and cards and have received very many back from our folks, um, but it sure isn't the same as holding someone's hand or looking them in the eye. But until very recently with the vaccines, COVID didn't permit that. On the social services side of things, where you know we have had a daily food pantry for many, many years, we averaged three or 400 bags of food a month before COVID. We're now averaging three to 4,000 bags a month after COVID and in the midst of it. Uh, we primarily used to uh, help folks who are houseless. Uh, that has dramatically shifted. And now the vast majority of the people who come for food aid are uh, many in our Filipino community and Chinese community folks who were employed in the visitor industry or uh, the airport and places like that that lost the bulk of jobs because of this uh, catastrophe. So we've seen our social side of things just kind of blow through the roof. Um, thankfully through IHS, Institute for Human Services, 
they were able to get our whole staff vaccinated uh, among the first group. Uh, we got vaccinated in January and February. So in terms of having people at least uh, safe to provide these services, uh, the vaccine really helped. What is the IHS? Sorry, I didn't know. IHS is the Institute for Human Services. It's the largest single provider of uh, services to the houseless. Uh, they began in the late 1970s with an, another Episcopal priest, Claude Dutille, who was handing out peanut butter sandwiches in Chinatown. And they are now, these many years later, a, a multi, multi million dollar social service agency. Uh, so um, is that supported by the state at all? Yes, the state, the county, the federal government, they have funding sources from all three, as well as private donations. Well, I, I, I'm just shocked um, to go from 400 to 4,000, um, that that is overwhelmingly difficult to, to uh, feel the, the pain that those people are enduring. This is, I mean, to have such a hit in Honolulu, where you feel the fruits on the trees and the coconuts are falling down from the palm trees and we have the ocean and yet there can be so much hurt and uh, need. That's, that's truly amazing. So I'm, I'm glad you said that and we can hear more specifics about that if, if you have them to share. So, the, so what has happened to the volunteers for the programs that are, are that you're still running. I mean, for that, who is helping with um, these uh, distributions, uh, Father? Because they must not be able to come. I mean, that's the problem. You have to be distant. Well, I, no, actually, that hasn't. It, it, the opposite is is the case. Um, just as the need has expanded, the numbers of people stepping up to volunteer has also. So there's huge numbers of people from the community who come to assist us in making bags, in handing out the bags of food, uh, coming to Food Bank with us to help us out with that. Uh, the Quakers have been wonderful. The Mormons have really stepped up with us. Uh, the Newman Center uh, of our Roman Catholic friends have been supplying uh, volunteers. Just folks come from all walks of life, uh, younger people. We have a, a young couple who's here from California who are living at our Catholic worker house at Wally House uh, for three months. And they've just been marvelous. You know, they've got lots of energy. They connect really well with people who are on the streets or otherwise having a difficult time. They're very enthusiastic. Um, and we've had a couple of gals who used to be on the street who now live in our container uh, apartment. And they have been enor an enormous help. Uh, Pat Gee featured them in the Star Advertiser a couple of Sundays ago. Um, so yeah, as the need has grown, so has volunteers. Uh, a number of our sister churches have basically redirected their social ministries to us so that we have kind of a central place to distribute sandwiches and hygiene and things like that. So yeah, it's been a lot of blessings along with the curse of this COVID. Well, as you, as you know, um, that, that there have been reports of, of breakouts in faith-based communities. I, I'm those re the one I'm aware of most recently is the Kauai's incident. And, and it was alarming, but it was a few people, but a few people was alarming also with COVID with, and, and hopefully, you know, not the other variant and that can be even more contagious, but it seemed like, and is it the case that the Department of Health is on top of it and um, right there um, at the ready to investigate it? Um, but the question is, are they doing things to help? Is that does that end up being DOH doing a due diligence to check the boxes and and follow procedures for public health policy? But are they helping? What do they? What does DOH do to help you? Well. I, I, I think just the guidance that they've provided to us that then goes to the folks who are, you know, in, in positions of authority above me, like our bishop, who then sends out guidance and directives to the churches. So we, most of our members continue to participate in worship services virtually, either through Facebook Live or Zoom. Um, Slowly, folks are coming back, uh, more so the people in the, in the neighborhood who might not have as ready access to technology. Um, 
for the longest time, we went from over 200 on a Sunday down to about 20. This past Sunday, we had 57 in church, um, but we're still practicing social distancing. Every other pew is marked off. Um, we began two weeks ago because everybody uh, was vaccinated to say no need masks. The CDC was recommending if you're vaccinated, you can't give it or get it indoors. But this past Sunday, because we've seen the spike locally, uh, we've resumed mask wearing uh, in the church uh, during the service. So we try to follow the science as best as we can. I think the situations of churches that where there have been outbreaks have been those who come from maybe a different kind of place theologically, um, who didn't believe in mask wearing and thought that God would protect them. I would like to ask them if they walk in front of buses on a routine basis so God will protect them, but um, I haven't asked that yet. But, you know, I think we need to be smart about how we deal with this. Those who are most vulnerable are, I think, wisely staying away at this point. And the hope is, is that we're coming to an end, but unless more people get vaccinated, I'm afraid we're going to be in this kind of twilight zone for a while. Well, do you have um, any comments on on that particular belief system that that provides people with this this notion they don't need to be vaccinated? Is this another thing they can go swim with the sharks and like Daniel went in the lion's den, they're going to be okay? Um, so they're going to be fine with the virus. Which, do you have any, any ways of well, about that that are helpful or how to help other I, people? I, I encourage our folks on a weekly basis to get vaccinated. Our church is open uh, twice a week, Wednesdays and Friday afternoons, in association with the We Are Oceania group, as well as Kalihi Palama Health Center in Queens. And we're providing free vaccinations twice a week. Uh, four hours uh, a, each day. And we are doing our utmost to encourage the other uh, church groups that use our facility. We have a number of Chukis, uh, smaller uh, groups. I talk to the pastors until they probably are sick of hearing from me, encouraging them to encourage their people to get the vaccination. There's just no excuse not to do it. I firmly believe it's our Christian duty to do it because not only do we protect ourselves and the gift of life that we've each been given, but even more importantly, from a Christian point of view, we're protecting our neighbor because you can be asymptomatic or have a mild case, but you can give it to somebody and it can be fatal to them. Uh, and that is particularly worrisome with this new variant coming around because the longer this uh, disease can mutate, and the more opportunities it has to mutate, the greater the chances that even this current vaccine could be overcome by it. So there's a real urgency to get people vaccinated. And, and I just don't have any patience for, for folks who talk about magic. You know, God gave us brains to use, and I'm pretty sure he expects us to use them. It's the old story of the fellow who's drowning in the ocean, and they throw him a life jacket, and they throw him a a buoy and they bring a helicopter by. And of course he refuses all of them because God's going to save him. And when he dies and goes up to the pearly gates, he says, why didn't you save me? And God says, I sent you the life preserver and the buoy and the helicopter. What more did you want? So, you know, go to hell. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, excuse me, but I'm on my day off. So I guess I can be a little risque. <laughs> some of the time of that with us in the and it's always the comic relief is always appreciated um mm -hmm. kind of the pacific islander community i know the church serves um several of those communities right T tongan in as well as chookies and um and do they um have vaccination hesitancy at all or how do they think about it no my experience with the pacific island community is Initially, it was an issue of just communication with getting it in the correct language to people so people knew about it. But I have not experienced any kind of any particular reluctance at all. Once people know where they can get it and how they can get it, um, for the most part, uh, everybody's lining up to, to get vaccinated. 
And, and it's a good thing because they are among the most vulnerable population groups and they tend to get the sickest when they get uh, sick. So, yeah. Well, are, are you um, referring to the multi-generational households and also the fact that, you know, certainly the matriarchs are performing numerous roles uh, with the, the handling of the, the, the nutrition and then being, of course, the nurse practitioner and all of that when there's ever any problem. Is that what you're referring to? That they're in, Certainly in part that, and those things are all very true. Uh, but, and the other part is, is that many of our Pacific Island friends have pre-existing health conditions, whether it be diabetes or overweight or uh, other kinds of medical conditions that can make COVID much, much worse. Well, um, have has your church lost um, those people? Have you, what, what have been the losses in the church congregation? If the, the only the only person who has died of COVID uh, in our community, uh, total population of about three hundred people, is one Tongan man in his forties who contracted it um, early on in the disease last spring, a year ago spring and left uh, a young family behind. Oh my gosh, was he in Hawaii when that happened? Oh, yeah. He... yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was just very, very, very tragic. Yeah. Very sad. Um, yeah, very sad. Um, I, um, I'm, I'm very, I, I'm just awful to hear that. So it's because it, it's not that it's unnecessary that these people are lost. It, <laughs> What is it? It's luck. I don't know. It's karma, or it's not even karma. I mean, it's just it's just kind of hard to. No, it's just it's random. It's random, and that's why people need to get vaccinated because you cannot risk getting it um, for yourself or for anybody else you might give it to. Absolutely. Well. What now that uh, what, one other question I had on, at the net grit level is now how are you um, are you spending more out of your precious budget for um, sanitation and cleaning and or air filtering? What's happened to you for meeting those requirements? I'm sure that the health department has made you aware of. Well, those things have kind of evolved over time. So when COVID first came out, yeah, we were spending quite a bit on sanitizers and sanitizing the pews and removing books and so forth. But I think the science more and more is, is that this is not a disease that's typically transmitted by touch uh, as much as it is by air. And so mostly it's the mask mandates. Um, we have not installed like extra air purifiers in the church. It wouldn't be practical for us to do it given the layout of the church. There's just so much open area that I don't know that we could accomplish it, but we just minimize the numbers of people who are allowed to gather um, and then require the mask wearing. Um, in terms of overall budgeting, we've been very fortunate. Uh, folks have continued to keep up with their pledges, and for that, we're extremely grateful. Uh, we were able to secure a small business association loan, uh, which is repayable over 30 years at a ridiculous interest rate. And so that helped us, as well as a PPP loan that took care of about 20% of our payroll costs in 2020. So financially, we're doing okay. Um, and, uh, and the question becomes though, once COVID is over, are people going to feel like they don't really need to get up for mass anymore because they can enjoy the mass on Zoom with their coffee and uh, snuggly bunny slippers on? We will see. <laughs> I must say. We will see. <laughs> <laughs> There's no travel time involved, but then of course you don't get your That's gas. Right. That's done. right. <laughs> you don't get your gas. That's right. Yeah. So that's really interesting. Yeah, I I know that you mentioned with the Department of Health um, being on top of things, and that part of their work was to help network or connect you to um, res maybe resources. But my my first question about this is, did they? Do they help you with getting connected with the state or the city county? And do, do you, are you on the list of those who are receiving funding from the feds for the re recent federal funding? Has that targeted the faith-based community or not? I, I'm, uh, I'm a little bit 
um, blank on what I saw in the bill for faith-based. What are you on the? Receiving? Yeah, I'm not. The, the the funds that I'm aware of that were available through the more recent government grants um, required a nonprofit to show a 20 or 25 percent reduction in gross receipts for one or two months of the previous um, some pe previous period of time, and we did not have that kind of reduction, uh, and therefore we did not qualify for that assistance. Well, I was just going to say you should bring in a smart lawyer to look over <laughs> your papers, but you are a smart lawyer. So you have it. That, that's really good news that you well, were. Yeah, yeah. That you wrote it. There wasn't that much erosion of that. Correct. that I'm glad to hear that. And it must be your management of it. But um, it just is that with people with no congregates there. And I guess today we're not necessarily. You're, churches aren't necessarily dependent on the collection uh, during services for uh, for for maintaining their budget because there's so many other ways to give is that the case and i think you know ordinarily you think well if the people aren't there and the basket's not coming around then what what about that i mean it seemed to me like that would be the first place you'd get that 20 percent reduction is that but we didn't. Uh, we've most about 25% of our budget comes from pledges, and that is typically mailed in or done online. Um, a certain percentage is done through the through the basket, but you know, it's the old story of the hundred dollar bill and the one dollar bill in the retirement home. And the one hundred dollar bill was talking about all the great cruises he'd been on and the Vegas trips and the plays he'd seen in New York, and the and the one dollar bill set kept kept saying. All I do is I go to church, I go to church, I go to church, I go to church. And the $100 bill said, well, what's a church? So the point being is that, yeah, usually it's dollar bills being put in the plate, <laughs> which we appreciate very much. Thank you. But it's not a significant part of our budget. Yeah. Uh, that, that just verifies. Yeah. That, that validates that. But things are, are differently, of course, you know, in this yeah. moved on from from that, yeah, I want my other question on in that way is what have, what have the church leaders, what, what's been the hierarchy's um, leadership on this here in Hawaii, I guess is that the bishop and then also uh, the Episcopal church is, is very tiered and hierarchical. And so uh, you have the archbishop and people that are, uh, have, have you had any leadership from them for solving these so we have, yeah, we have a presiding bishop nationally, uh, Michael Curry, and the national church has, of course, been very helpful in putting information out to the whole, to the whole uh, church across the country. Uh, our bishop, Bob Fitzpatrick, is very committed to following the science and doing his very best to try to keep us uh, in line with that and to make recommendations and so forth. So we you know, we don't have, uh, we usually give communion in both kinds, the bread and the wine. We have not uh, provided the wine uh, during COVID. Um, we are, we, for the longest time, we even stopped uh, Holy Communion uh, just because of the concern about person to person, the touching transmission. But as that clarified itself, we have uh, returned to the bread only. So yeah, but so that's it. Yeah, and the bishop's been very good and very helpful. And um, th this is a, a disease that's constantly changing, and and it's throwing some new punches now. And we're just trying to roll with those punches as best as we can, and and do our best to keep folks safe, and at the same time stay connected as best we can. Well, have you had any financial support from from the bishop or uh, the funds he's associated with? Whether was there any additional funding provided? Not specifically due to COVID, but we had a couple of requests that uh, we made to the diocese that were granted for five or ten thousand dollars. Yeah. Okay, so there was some go-to for that. Well, I, I'm glad to hear um, that it's not uh, the disaster that I had imagined we might be talking about, but it is a disaster, mm -hmm. nevertheless. It is. Not about, yeah. I mean, it can always be worse. Well, um, tell me a little bit more about. What have been, <laughs> if we can put it this way, what what are the lessons learned uh, in this in this crisis situation, Father David? What what are you getting from this so on the positive side? I mean, oh, 
You know, I, there's been a lot of positives, uh, I think, from COVID. I think it's restructured the way almost all of us deal with work. Um, you know, the, the nine to five in the office is perhaps a thing of the past. Um, it's given a lot of folks some time just to be um, instead of running hither and yon. The separation from each other has had its difficulties, but it also has had the blessing of just giving some time to be quiet, I think. Um, so we, sh you know, we'll see. And we're, now we're talking about returning to normal. And, and part of us, we're seeing a rebellion among our wider community over the number of tourists coming. And we haven't even opened up to the international market yet, which was the dominant part of our tourist uh, business before COVID. And we're already feeling overrun by mainland tourists. How do we do this? And, and how do we move forward? And, and at least people are having that conversation um, in a very serious way, I think, because where we were heading, I don't believe was sustainable for a whole number of reasons. And it, it really is time for us to re-examine how we do capitalism, how we do our economy, that growth isn't something that can be endlessly sustained without destroying the planet. I think indigenous people are finding their voice at long last and helping us to learn about how do we survive on this planet? Indigenous people have managed for 200,000 years to keep humanity alive and Western man in the last 160 years has brought us to the brink of destruction. So something is very wrong. And I think in that sense, a pandemic like this COVID has grabbed us all by the uh, scruff of the neck and said, time to reevaluate. And the question, of course, is will we? Yeah, that's the question, isn't it? Yeah. Well, has there been a particularly heroic effort or a story? Is there a story of a heroic effort that made a really big difference um, over this year? Um, or, or is it uh, the gifts are, you know, at this these levels of, of really the transformation of, uh, of the way we think about ourselves and our world and how we do well, it. I, I think just the fact that so many people are willing to step up and provide services to those in our community who are really desperate is an act of heroism, um, particularly because this is a disease that, you know, if you want to be super safe, you just stay in your room. So to venture out and to meet strangers and to interact with them under these conditions, I think is real heroism. Not to mention the folks who are checking me out at the Safeway uh, or at Foodland and just the regular working people, the bus drivers, um, the cab drivers who are keeping this economy going, keeping all of us going, they are really the heroes. Mm -hmm. Those are the heroes. Well, you know, uh, we are getting to Aloha time here uh, and in our talk together and uh, we'll have to wrap it up. Um, but this is the state of the state of Hawaii on uh, Think Tech Hawaii Broadcasting. And I'm your host, Stephanie Stahl Dalton. And we've been talking with uh, Father David uh, Gearlack, who's rector at St. Elizabeth Episcopal Church in Palama. And I thank him very much. Thank you, Father David, for participating on our show today and, and illuminating your what, what it's like to be in the midst of this whirlwind, whirlwind tsunami. Uh, what a hurricane of a pandemic. And it sounds like there have been many good things that have happened in addition to the challenges that you've had. So we'll be back in two weeks. Aloha and uh, mahalo for your attention.